The Sapphire technology was designed and built to replicate the atmosphere of the sun in a laboratory on Earth and to test the electric sun model. These are the factors we control. These are some of the things the Sapphire Lab is now capable of. These are some of our recent discoveries. In our tests and experiments, we have found no disparities with the electric sun model. In fact, all the evidence to date indicates that electricity is the primal force in the universe. Michael Claridge arrives from Boston. CN, CNO, o, CN2. We have just completed our latest experiments in the lab and we're confronted with mountains of information and imagery from a score of data recorders. Are we looking at 10 times because we're thinking about it as a stabilized result or are we looking at it 10 times because we're also looking at the slope? The plan is to park ourselves in my garage for two weeks and prepare for the upcoming conference in the UK. Well, if memory serves correctly, when I was doing my analysis and you watch it actually go through this, we might actually even see it on the video. Here's what I'm going to show you. Starting from your left, again, about the same temperature. Analyzing the sapphire data is like going through a door, only to discover another door beyond. Doors upon doors opening to unfamiliar territory. We're looking for a coherent story that we can present at the conference. And I say that it, it's uh, 103, Something that happens in a few seconds in the lab can take weeks to analyze. Turning those analysis into a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation is another challenge altogether. A year ago, the Sapphire Review Team set the agenda for the next 12 months. The plan was to focus on three things. Energy, transmutation, and finding parallels between the Sapphire Sun in the lab and the sun in the sky. During the year, we also gave talks at the Electric Universe UK conference in 2018 the New England Venture Summit, and MIT in Boston. It is two days away from the conference in Bath, and we still don't have our story yet. Scott Mainwaring and I go over the material to be presented at the conference tomorrow. Pretty amazing. So we know that there's nitrogen and hydrogen in here. Scott was responsible for our original mandate, which was to test the electric sun model by replicating the atmosphere of the sun in a lab on Earth. Given the discoveries of the last 12 months, Scott states that we've fulfilled our research objectives and our mandate. Uh, but we are getting titanium.
The International Science Foundation has given us the amazing luxury of doing pure science for the last five years. Now it is for us to turn what we've learned into something useful, something beneficial to humanity. I realize the story Michael and I have been struggling to articulate is only partly about what we've discovered this past year. The more complete story needs to include our new mandate. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Monty Charles and Dr. Michael Claridge, The Sapphire Project. Can you hear me now? Amazing. Wow, oh, you can hear everything, can't you? I can even hear myself. So, we're going to start from the beginning. There's two fundamental components to thermodynamics when you're heating something up. If you have a pot of water and you have a candle underneath it, it might take an hour to heat it up to bring it to a boil. Then it stabilizes at that temperature. So, that's what we call steady state. What's important is that if you take a blowtorch from the mine down the road, okay, that they use to melt steel and put it underneath the pot, that rise in temperature is going to happen maybe within a couple of seconds and the water will come to its steady state or maybe it'll go on and just vaporize it. So I want you to keep that in mind as we walk through this section. In the lab, when we're running, that particular bright ball, so Ben's there, he's capturing his video, we're capturing video on our screens and our computers. And... Uh, yes. Hydrogen flowing. Yes. Yes, okay. 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 The anode, you heard me saying that, bring it back, bring the power back, bring it back, bring it back, back, please, bring it back. The reason is because we're reaching the reactor maximum temperature and we weren't able to stop it. Dr. Lowell Morgan, myself, and a guy by the name of Tommy Mello, who actually works in development of computational fluid dynamics code. And that code is used by NASA and Lockheed and others and all kinds of corporations to do thermodynamic analysis. In other words, rocket engines, cooling systems, and the transfer of heat and energy. It's very complex, very expensive, but it's very powerful software, and that's what we use today. So we can predict very accurately, if we understand the, the, the factors involved, how something should perform. And that's how they design your car engines, so they don't overheat anymore. Our calculations showed that we needed, in order for us to reach maximum reactor temperature, our power supply had to be at 100% power output. So just imagine 100% means that you've got a blowtorch underneath the pot. The max temperature of the chamber should be about 113 degrees Celsius. The other numbers, we just kind of tested at different levels of what kind of temperatures that the chamber should respond to. The 7% we're going to get into in a few seconds is actually where the power was set when you see that anode and where we're actually creating the transmutation of elements. This is a model, some of you may have seen it from 2016 when we did the analysis. When it's cooled with the cooling systems at full power, shouldn't reach much higher than about 110, 113 degrees. But at full power, cooling system on, steady state, 100, 113 degrees. When we did our calculations, each of us did them separately, we were all within 50 degrees of each other. Without cooling, the chamber would heat up to 500 degrees Celsius. So that 100 degrees, 110, actually represents 500 degrees Celsius without cooling. So when I say 50 degrees, you might say, well, that's 50%, but it's actually 50 degrees of the 500. And then we put cooling on it, and it should come to this. So for three years, we've been running the experiment. 
And Sapphire has responded predictably until now. We have on our SCADA system, you'll see here on the screen at the bottom is 113 degrees. We have thermocouples. We have 12 thermocouples all around the chamber measuring to make sure that it's stable and we can monitor these things because it's important. So what this graph is, is a video. The red line represents the infrared camera. That's the one we're looking at the anode to tell what its temperature is so it doesn't, it's not compromised thermally or melt. The blue one is called a bolometer. It measures, you might say, a relative energy measurement of what's coming off the anode. It's not a total measurement of energy as such of what sapphire is putting out. The gold line is actually the thermocouple. So this is a day's worth of experiment sped up a couple of thousand times. This is what our day looks like. We work very quickly, as you can see. <laughs> Not interesting, right at the peak. So it's climbing and falling. We're changing chemistry, you might say the gas composition, power settings. And we're monitoring the thermal temperature of the anode and the chamber. Yes, that is the anode melting. We didn't know it at the time because it was happening so slowly. But when we realized what was happening, we had to shut Sapphire down. It got to, it just got too hot. What I want you to observe here is the angle of that yellow line. And that is real time rise in temperature over time. This is the real time. And the rise in temperature over time is identical to what we calculated at 100% max power, but we're only at 7%. The fall here represents after we shut it down, as you saw in the video, we couldn't control at that point in time, so we started dialing the power back. And we were only at 7%. For me, doing mechanical engineering and what I do, everybody gets excited, well, it's all this heat. For me, it's like, can we run the reactor? Now, this next picture is not a black and white. This next picture shows you when we change the composition of the catalyst, it actually takes heat out of the system to a point where the anode, if you can see it here, doesn't even register, and that's at max power. Dial's turned up to 11, okay? And that's what we get. So we can cool it down. So we can introduce certain compositions and things and take energy out of the system. 100% max power gives you 100% maximum thermal stable state energy or heat in the chamber. 7% gave us 100% plus because we couldn't track what was going to stop. I don't like to boast about our errors, so our calculations were only off by 93%. I'm 62, and I'm telling you the truth. I've never been off 93% in any of the engineering I've ever done in the past. And uh, that's a big number. It's not just me. It was Lowell. It was Tommy. The chamber shouldn't be doing this. Sapphire can create, control, contain, and repeat any number of plasma regimes. For five years, Sapphire has performed exactly within the limits it was designed for. Until now. This recent catalytic event was not predicted, and according to plasma physics, it should not have happened. So there's your double layers. But it did. So we see a little bit of puffing. This is calling into question our understanding of plasma physics and will require a new math you can definitely see the tufts in the, uh, UV. and the collaboration of complementary disciplines to resolve. These recent catalytic events have not been observed before. They're new and show the potential for a clean, energy efficient reactor. Go to the center button to the left. Transmutation. Finally, in 2017, we had some interesting results, but we weren't in a place to talk about it with confidence. Today we are. So this is before. This is during our plasma discharge. What's interesting about this is that the plasma double layers have collapsed down and become very intense around the anode, and now it's giving a 
a uniform coronal glow. Just keep this in mind as we go through this presentation. And this is after. And we said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> we had other words. So we decided it was time to subject it to what's called scanning electron microscopy and EDACs. They kind of go hand in hand. Technology has been around for 30 years, and scanning electron microscopy is just a very powerful microscope. EDACs basically is technology where they energize the elements that are on the sample, and they can tell you definitively what those elements are. And they use it for forensic sciences, all kinds of things. And it's a standard piece of equipment. It's about a million bucks for one. I wouldn't say it's standard or common, but it's very good. So this is June in another lab that we work with and what we did with the sample. So when you go over a sample like this on a scanning electron a microscope, it's almost like scanning over top of a planetary surface. So just imagine that you're in a satellite or a rocket and you're saying, well, that's interesting. So pretend you're in there. We're zooming in with the microscope. Things get interesting. And then we said, what are you doing there? <laughs> a ball. And then you can get into all kinds of discussions about how a sphere can form in an experiment like this. And there's a lot of people that agree that to get a sphere like this has to form in a non-gravitational environment. So if you want to make spheres, you throw particles up that are heated. And as they glide through the atmosphere, they become spherical. We don't know what it was. We didn't know why it was there. There's better pictures of this, but just take a look at some. There's some almost like tectonic thing happening here. We can't tell you some of, the, some of the things that we did to get there, but we can show you the results. So if you see some of the elements missing, that's some of the elements that we, we can't discuss. But what's interesting is these elements that you see were not in the chamber before. And sapphire is making lanthanum, and it's making cerium. And it's making carbon, and it's making oxygen. So we went and scanned another region. He said, well, that's interesting. That doesn't look like the base materials at all. And this is what we found. We found phosphorus and silicon and titanium and oxygen and magnesium and calcium and sodium and potassium and aluminum and carbon and chlorine and sulfur. Those were also not, and we know definitively they were not in there. What you see here in the previous slide is that these formations are actually growing out of the surface. It's growing. That's what they look like. This, this looks like actually a fish egg sack full of particles and things. So he said, well, nobody's going to believe us because, well, we're the Sapphire team, and of course, we're completely biased. That's how they're going to see it. So he said, this particular agency said, we have a lab for you if you want to validate your results and send it down to this lab. And it's a lab that they use and Lockheed uses and others. And we said, okay, we want you to go and scan the sample and tell us what you find. And this is what they found. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting ball into what is going on there. It's like these particles forming in here. And they confirmed the fact that the predominant elements of that ball are cerium and lanthanum. These are heavy elements. And they scanned another area. And they came up with titanium, chromium, zinc, phosphorus, and carbon. What we did is because our EDX machine isn't as good as theirs, they have a bigger budget, they can resolve for carbon in some of the lighter elements, and they sold us some of the predominant elements there. In fact, sapphire is making carbon, zinc is not there, and neither is the phosphorus. So this is some of the things that it's making, but there's even more coming. What's interesting is the topography, and this is as close as we're going to get. This is basically, you might say, it doesn't look like crystals, but in metallurgy you use the word crystalline structure. You can see how the top surface of the main nodules in the material have been eroded. What's also interesting is the vent holes that are here in this material. So we said, well, that's interesting. Let's go and take a look down in between these mountains or these, these guys. And we found other things like calcium and chlorine and carbon and potassium. 
And these are certified materials. So we got them from a certified company, certified spectroscopy done on the materials before we actually put it in the chamber. So we want to make sure we're doing good science before we start making claims like this, especially these kinds of claims. We start off with a periodic table of elements, and we're using the word catalyst because we can't think of a better term to use for the types of gas constituent or composition and the materials that we have that the anode is being exposed to. So we're just saying these are catalysts. We introduce those into the chamber, and when we fire it up in that nice bright anode that you saw that looks like a sun, this is what it returned. These are the new elements, minus the catalyst. The aluminum and silica we wrote off because, well, our probe, it's alumina. So we figure, well, maybe some contamination. I mean, maybe making it, may not be, but we're just going to say, look, let's just dismiss it. But you have a pile more that Sapphire is making. Now, what's cool about this is that we can repeat the experiment. Okay. And get the same results. And we've dialed it up and we've dialed it down. And we can, you know, it's tuned. That's why when Wall was talking about, you know, good technology, bringing to bear modern technology that Berkeley didn't have, well, this is what modern technology can bring us. It can bring us some answers or actually maybe more questions. So optical spectroscopy, this is Michael's thing. I'm his Padawan, okay, when it comes to optical spectroscopy. But he's going to talk to you about what we found in the atmosphere. The optical spectroscopy is used to study the atmosphere of the discharge. What Mani was talking about is a surface analysis of the metal. Optical spectroscopy is used, again, to study the atmosphere around the anode. I'm going to have to go over there. Okay. <laughs> this is wavelengths of light coming out of the chamber, and optical spectroscopy is like a really fancy prism that shows you the rainbow colors that are in your glowing sample. It's a wonderful science. It's been perfected for so many decades that it's one of the most reliable tools that an astronomer or a plasma physicist has to study. When you light up the chamber at low discharge with a simple atmosphere, you might see that line and maybe one more here, okay? Because it's a very simple discharge. It's easy to know what's in there. When you turn up the power and you get things really rolling in there, you get this whole sea of lines. A lot of elements produce similar lines. When you start getting complicated, it's not so easy, but it's a wonderful game. It's like Sudoku on, on steroids. You try to find out what elements might be producing the lines that you're seeing. It's part of the art of the, of the science there. And it took us a while, but then we noticed this triplet here. This is a triplet of lines that are very close together. This triplet here and this triplet here. And our intuition said, Let's focus on those, because that's so unique of a fingerprint. No group of elements would make that. It's got to be one. That was the intuition, at least. And if you ask your optical spectroscopy software to match the known lines of different elements, after a lot of hunting, we came across manganese. And manganese lies exactly on this triplet, this triplet, and this triplet. It's basically impossible that that could be any other, statistically impossible, any other element or group of elements. These other ones, we don't know yet. We're still hunting. It takes a lot of hours to hunt this sort of a diagram. So that means that we have manganese, which is another metal, that is in the atmosphere, but not on the surface, right? We don't know why but it's, it's very clear that that's happening. We also saw in the atmosphere, the green ones here, the lithium is also in the atmosphere that was not on the surface, the manganese, and then the sodium, the Na there, that appears in both the surface of the anode and in the atmosphere. One of my challenges when we designed Sapphire was that, okay, we can do post-experimental analysis on lots of materials, but the real challenge is when is it happening? So if you do see transmutation, do you know when or under what conditions these reactions are happening? And so what we can tell you today is we know now when it's happening. It's because the spectroscopy tells us we can dial it up and we see it come up 
and we can dial it down and it disappears except for the prominent lines of the particular gas constituent we have in there. So what we can tell you is that the manganese is not one of the gas, part of the gas compositions. We know that. And this is laboratory quality stuff and not with that kind of signal. You're going to enjoy this. So always when we're running these experiments, part of my job is to keep in mind the connection with cosmology. Cosmology allows you to place everything that you might experience as a human on this planet into some framework. And that has definitely been at the start of the Sapphire project as well. Here is some framework to put some of these results in. This is his normal rate, speed. Monty, keep up. Planets, very dynamic electrical systems. Currents flowing in and out. And from what it, we know now, it's not a simple it's not simply a current like flowing through a wire into, a, into something and out the other end. Current flows in and out of the North Pole. Current flows in and out of the South Pole. I just drew one of the ring currents up there. I think we're up to about four or five now that we know about. It's very complicated stuff. So let's take that starting point as what we know about our local environment. put it inside the solar system. So stars also, they do have, and we will eventually measure it, currents going in and out of their poles as well. The numbers are a little tough to nail down, but a planet might have 10 to the seventh, so 10 million amps more or less flowing in. A star might have a billion amps flowing in and out of it. You start to see the pattern when you draw the pictures. This is a cosmic blueprint, if you will, for how electrical structures are formed. Each star is also following this blueprint, but then its sub-members also follow the blueprint. The planets are receiving their energy from their star. The star is connected to its source of power. The planets are connected to their source of power, and their source of power is their sun. So you have to imagine, if not direct currents flowing between them, at least some sort of resonance or induction. But the planets only get their power from, from their sun. If you imagine one of those being Jupiter, say one of those planets there, when we look at the sky, we see Jupiter as a dot, pretty small dot, right? But the magnetosphere of Jupiter, the body, the real body of Jupiter is, is huge. It would take up, if you did this with your arm to the nighttime sky, that's how big the body of Jupiter would look if we had eyes to see it. Okay, so composition of planets, as Wall so well said years ago, we understand planetary formation so little currently that we need a different theory of planetary formation for every planet in our solar system. One of the patterns that we see in electrical systems throughout all of nature is membranes, boundaries. The plasma naturally forms its own version of a membrane or a boundary. So we'll start with our star, shorthand it, right? And then we'll ask, how does the star fit in its world? the neighborhoods that it comes from and lives in. So that green there is an interstellar filament, which you can kind of see in the background of the slide here. And the stars are set up on those filaments. Before the advent of the Herschel and Planck space telescopes, we honestly believe that the stars were randomly distributed in the sky. We believe that, right? And then once you see the filaments, Every star we see in the sky is on a filament. There's no randomness to it if you can see the underlying structure behind it. Okay. 
There's also these other blobs that we see now, and as a scientific community, we're bounded by what we already know about. And so they have a name, they're called proto-stars. Anytime somebody uses the word proto, you know they don't know what they're talking about, right? <laughs> so I don't think they're stars. They might be, I don't know. The point is, they might be something else. They don't have to be on this track that we call be a star, right? They could be something else that is needed in the interstellar medium. We have found, to date, over 200 organic molecules in the interstellar medium. I'm sure that number will continue to grow exponentially as we study more and more. One of the big questions, of course, is where do they come from? How do they form? How do they get there? Now, what about the inorganics in the interstellar medium? Again, the number keeps growing, but these have been known about for quite a while. That group right there of 11 elements, inorganics, metals, are known to be out there in the interstellar medium. How do they get there? Why are they there? Big questions, right? We thought, well, wait a minute, we, we, we have a list to compare this to. Why don't we compare this known list from stars in the interstellar medium? Why don't we compare that to which ones we find in Sapphire, right? <laughs> yeah, so pretty good, right? I think the evidence speaks for itself. I think the evidence okay. speaks for itself. <laughs> it might even demand a verdict. Yes, yeah, right. right. Well. Interesting experiment would be to increase the voltage in steps. And, uh, well, Michael was talking about doing that. I think, we need, I think we need to do that. Very thing. Increase the voltage, decrease the voltage, to see if that field increases or decreases. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can start running. Get ready. Get running. And ready, go. Right. Dark mode plasma, this was something that, for our research, started from Scott Mainwaring, who quoted that wonderful line from Edgar Allan Poe about there being dark, sky, dark stars in the sky. I don't know the exact quote, but that's, that was in the back of our minds all this time as to, well, what's going on in a plasma environment that's under tension, but it's not discharging? That's an important question, right? And uh, even though it was on our docket for exploration, when we found it, we weren't looking for it. There's the whole, um, so in Passion's discharge thing, there's the uh, Townsend dark mode where, which is the current flow before Whoa. it breaks down. Right. So I think that's what we're seeing, it's just that. Peter Townsend? Look at the shape of that. Ha <laughs> ha! So now we know our research area. Yes. I'm confused by what I'm seeing. I'm trying to figure out how that is even. And you, and you thought you had emotional problems before yeah. you started? <laughs> <laughs> I you understand. I formally rescind ownership. I thought you understand why it is that Lowell just had a meltdown. <laughs> Life in the lab. Life in the lab, yes. So here's a, that's an image of dark mode <laughs> plasma, yeah. This is our anode, right? And so just to give you a picture, that's in the center of the chamber. But the probe, our, our voltage probe, comes in from the outside and measures the floating potential of the plasma as it's moving around in the chamber. And at a certain point, the probe started going crazy, but there's no discharge in the chamber. And we spent some time studying the spatial extent of that strange phenomena. It varies in size depending upon the parameters in the atmosphere, right? How big that, that boundary is. Go. Right. That's interesting. It is interesting, isn't it? Laboratory. What I find interesting about it is the magnitude of the voltage here. You got the frequency happening here, but look at the height of the voltage. It's just flat. 748, still 120, 30. Around 110, 120. And ready, go. Should start up further now. And it does. Look at that. Yes, you could change the diameter. Exactly. What's amazing about this it's is that we have a very sharp voltage drop just off the surface so of the anode. This was this third round. Plasma yeah, double yeah, layer. Yeah, you're done. And there's no visible plasma. 
voltage goes to almost zero and it goes right back up to almost the anode potential and there's no plasma. So I want to contrast it to the glow mode, just so you get a reference. We would call that a form of glow mode. Anode in the middle, a very clear atmosphere, very clear boundary at the edge of the discharge. When you run the potential probe through that, you see that chart on the left. So that's electrical potential, that's the voltage at that point in space, at that point in the plasma. And you can see when you come up, there's that sharp boundary coming up from the left, say that sharp boundary, that's that outer edge of the blue ball, the glowing mode. And as you come in, the potential rises very steeply. You'll notice the potential drops down basically to zero right before you touch the anode. And then when you touch the anode, it jumps up to the voltage we set the anode to. This is what we saw running the probe in and out of the dark mode. So we had the chamber under tension, a lot of volts. You don't see anything going on. But then you can see that's the chart of what the probe is telling us is in the chamber. And there's a lot of arguments about what it is this is telling us. And as a contrast, you can see put them stacked over each other. Very different behavior, very different shapes, very different sizes of potential in there. I want to emphasize that we don't know what it means, okay? There's some previous research on this sort of thing where the probe you're running in a chamber discharge shows this kind of really rapid and intense pulsations, but no one's studied it spatially. It brings you right up against the problem we've known since the 20s, which is you can't actually measure anything without affecting it. There's this idealization that you can somehow measure something that's really there, even if you're not looking at it, okay? But that's not the truth of nature. So we know it's an interaction between our probe and the anode, but nature is always that way. If you think about the solar system and the, the electrical distribution in the solar system, it's not just a sun sitting there in isolation. There's planets, there's comets, and all of those you could say serve as the probe in the solar system. And so they're going to be experiencing something like this. I'll talk tomorrow about some of the astronomical implications of that. Wait, so how are we going to do that? Well, one is going to be a mass spectrometer. Because as soon as we put in hydrogen deuterium alone, okay, we see hydrogen deuterium count one, we saw this yesterday, on the whole side, okay, we try to get it. So, yeah. The SAFIRE team is now developing the new mandate for SAFIRE. So we want to be able to understand, like, does it put all the hydrogen out to the side? Or does it put the How material? slow is slow? Oh, okay, so there's a point here that that's the nitrogen. We're going to take what we've learned and turn it into something useful. For the immediate future, we are focused primarily on clean energy generation. We have already designed a prototype energy generator. Hydrogen deuterium molecule, or maybe it's helium 3. The sum of these things really came together in the last maybe three weeks. And we're saying, well, what's the sapphire story? Okay, so we want to change the conversation from zero point energy and free energy to efficiency. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more tomorrow because there's no free lunch. If you think about your cars, the oil's out there and it's in the ground and it gets sequestered and it gets pulled and it's put into tanks and then it's refined and then it's pumped into your tank where it's actually focused and you burn it, you, you harvest the energy that that has to offer. Actually, the same thing happens with hydroelectric dam. Now you've got this river running through it, you put up a dam, we focus that potential energy into one particular place. We do the same thing with uranium. We want to, in the Sapphire team, change the conversation from zero-point energy and these kinds of things out there because we don't believe they happen like that. We don't see it in nature. Energy generation is all about efficiency. How one determines efficiency is much debated. But the Wall Street Journal factored in the cost of the fuel itself, the cost of production, 
the cost of damage that fuel and ore production does to the environment, and came up with a picture like this. Ultimately, nature itself shows us the most efficient way to do things. Sapphire will fit somewhere in this picture. The fact that the main fuel is hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe, and that the process is clean and produces no negative side effects or waste products, makes Sapphire a very attractive energy generating technology. Elemental transmutation occurs both in nature and in the laboratory and is not a new phenomenon. Studies done at MIT have shown that when radioactive waste is exposed to hydrogen isotope nuclei, the observed decay rate of the radioactive material is effectively increased. Sapphire produces copious amounts of hydrogen nuclei that interact with other elements creating self-organizing spherical plasma double layer shells. Within these shells, electrons, ions, and molecules are trapped by powerful electromagnetic fields. This is where radioactive material would be exposed to the hydrogen nuclei to remediate the radioactivity of that material. One of the confusing aspects, if you only think that gravity and turbulence and heat are your causal factors, none of this is ever, you can never explain this, how there's so much structure. We see a spatial structure there, right? One of the benefits of the current suite of telescopes around the Earth is that you can also see elements and energetic states of elements, and those are segregated also. So what you might be looking at here is a center region of hydrogen that has been collected in the middle. And then that bright boundary might be a layer of excited hydrogen. Right outside of that, that orange boundary, might be cold carbon monoxide just sitting right there, right next to that inner shell. And then right outside of that, you might find energized calcium sitting right next to those other layers. How that happens we see that naturally in the sapphire chamber. All those double layers and different structures you see, those are segregated and separated different elements, molecules, and energetic states. And we're not trying to force it to do that. We don't have a giant billion dollar ITER machine that uses 20 megawatts of energy to try to just contain the plasma so it doesn't blow apart. We're not trying to force anything in our chamber. We are studying what nature shows us, what it gives us naturally of our own design. <laughs> so, summary. So we have energy, we have transmutation, and we have the sun and interstellar medium. We see a cohesive picture. The electric sun model gave us the premise with which to engineer the sapphire reactor. Oh, there we go. Point four. Once constructed, the proof of concept bell jar version of sapphire was up and running within minutes. Likewise, once constructed, the 44,000 part sapphire reactor was also up and running within minutes. At every step of the way, the electric sun model's predictions proved accurate. What if the process used to create the sapphire sun turns out to be similar to the process that creates the real sun and stars? 
the scientific community would have a field day with door opening. That would be the big picture. In all our experiments and discoveries, we have found no disparities with the electric sun model. All the evidence to date points to electricity as the primal force in nature. We believe the SAFIRE project validates and supports the electric sun model. SAFIRE's new mandate is to create beneficial and commercially viable transformative technologies for humanity. That's what tomorrow's talk will be about. It'll be really the story. And where do we go from here? And what should we do with Sapphire? Should we stop the research? <laughs> okay. Caesar. <laughs> Up, down. Okay, off of their heads. So I guess we'll leave that with you. Hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>